Welcome, everybody, to the fifth edition of the 150 lecture series. This is the fifth time we've gotten together since we started the series at the end of August. Um, this is our first of two panel discussions. Um, I will leave the introductions to the moderator, Dan Urban, but prior to that, I wanted to do a little housekeeping. Um, is anyone in the audience here for the first time in this building? Oh, welcome. Welcome. <laughs> um, so it's a wonderful building full of local art. If you are interested in looking at the art any business day, you're welcome to come in and wa walk through the building. The artwork is beautiful. The fourth floor is typically locked, but you can go to the clerk's office on the second floor and get a swipe card to come up here. And, and I can tell you a lot of people do that, and they bring friends and family, and it's a really wonderful building to visit. Um, restrooms are out the doors to your left, emergency exits in both directions. <laughs> it's my, my airline attendant hand waving. Um, oh, and I'm Mercy Davis, and I work for the town of Normal, but I, that's not important today. Um, I do want to ask, we, we did this the last couple lectures, how many of you have attended one lecture, at least one lecture? Okay, how many of you have attended two lectures at least? Keep your hands up, how many of you have been to three? How many of you have been to f all four of them up to now? Okay, Sonia, well, <laughs> so that's excellent. Well, thank you all for your support. This has been a wonderful series. It's all being recorded. All previous um, presentations are on the website. We are getting written text up as well as uh, to the extent possible, and today's is also being streamed live to billions of people across the globe, just like the Oscars. Um, and this will be um, uploaded as well in the next few days. So without further ado, I will turn this over to Dan Irvin. Thank you. And welcome uh, to everyone. I'm really, really excited about this. We've got, well, I'm a little bit of a history buff and uh, a, a, a townie. And uh, remember with fondness what the panel title is referring to as normal normal's boom year to 1993 um, and we've got a tremendous panel and as one of the panelists noted as we did our little pre-discussion there's a heck of a lot of expertise about that period of time that's in the audience. So we're, we're looking forward to a kind of a very, although everybody's dressed up in their Sunday best, uh, we're looking forward to a very kind of informal discussion of that, of that period of time. And uh, it, it, it should be wonderful. Uh, very quickly, these folks really need no introduction, but just in case you don't know them. Uh, closest to me, in no particular order, just geographical order. Closest to me is Dr. Susan Kern, uh, longtime, what's the word, executive at uh, Illinois State University that will be uh, providing, if you will, the gown side of the town and gown that is our wonderful town of Normal. And uh, on Susan's left, uh, a longtime, now retired mayor of the uh, town of Normal, Paul Harmon. And next to him, uh, well, during this boom period, to as his partner in crime, longtime city manager David Anderson, and then representing the the business side, uh, Randy Wood, a longtime uh, business owner uh, uh, of the music shop, a key uh, ingredient of the business mix of uh, the whole of normal, but uh, specifically during this period of time, the uh, what used to be probably during that time referred to as downtown, but what is now uptown normal. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a more in-depth introduction of each of these uh, people, allow them to make a few remarks, and I'll go on to the next one. We'll go through all four. I've got a couple of questions I'd like to ask these folks, and then we'll, uh, we'll also throw things open for questions from the audience. Mercy has a microphone so that uh, all of those billions of people uh, out on the internet are able to hear your question, and we'll, uh, we'll go from there. I'm going to start with Dr. Susan Kern. Uh, she was a faculty member at Illinois State from 
1974 to 2005, and I'll interrupt myself just for a second and tell you guys if I miss something that you think is important, you can obviously go ahead and jump in with, with what that is. Uh, so 1974 to 2005, uh, Dr. Kern, uh, she was executive officer and assistant to the president from 1980 to 1998 and vice president for university advance. And after that, from 1998 to 2005, one of four vice presidents reporting to the president. She served uh, ISU for 31 years on the faculty and administrative roles including five presidents as executive officer, assistant to the president, and vice president of university advancement. And prior to coming to ISU, she worked in private industry and on government-funded research projects, led the university's first comprehensive campaign, Redefining Normal, which raised $97 million for ISU. Among her awards, the Leadership America program, Top 100 Women in 1996, a YWCA Woman of Distinction in 1993, and uh, Outstanding Alumni Service Award from my alma mater as well, Purdue University, boiler up. Let's uh, acknowledge Dr. Susan Kern. Thank you. I learned a little bit about you. I didn't know you were a <laughs> boilermaker. Well, thank you all for coming today. Uh, I think this is going to be a wonderful panel, and it was a great 31-year time period for me to work at Illinois State University. I did have the pleasure of either working personally with or knowing personally four of the five presidents that led the university during this time period. Um, I served in a lot of those different positions, and in those positions, I had the opportunity to sit at the table to hear all of the discussions, to offer my advice sometimes, to disagree on other days, and um, always in the end, though, support what the leadership of Illinois State University was trying to accomplish between 1967 and 1993. And I wish I could talk about the next 25 years, too, but since I have to cut it off in 93, I'll only address uh, those, those years that were assigned to me. As I prepared for today's panel, uh, I had the opportunity to reminisce and meet with some of the very distinguished uh, decision makers during this time period. Uh, Dr. Warren Hardin, uh, Charles Morris, Neil Gamsky, former State Senator John Maitland, and of course, uh, Vice Pre uh, President, uh, Vice President when I knew him, and President David Strand, who is here today and I hope will uh, join us in the discussion a little bit later on. Some of you may have read many of the books that have been written about Illinois State University, and uh, the history is fairly well documented and summarized in these books. And what I hope to, to do, though, today is, since I sat at the table and listened to the discussions, I hope that I can fill in a little bit of the rest of the story for you. They were exciting times for Illinois State, and I want to just go through quickly some of the highlights that I think were accomplished during this time period. I want you to reflect with me on this time. During, between 1967 and 1993, Illinois State University enhanced, changed, and focus, refocused its mission and became a very different type of university than it was in 1967. We tore down blocks of the town of Normal and expanded the campus. We planned, occupied, or built just about every building you see at Illinois State University with the exception of those that are on the quadrangle. And you think about that, that happened in this time period. We diversified and internationalized the faculty and the staff. Uh, and uh, particularly the students, much to some people's chagrin. Not everyone was happy with us when we attempted to do that. We made critical decisions affecting Redbird Arena, ISSCS, the Bone Student Center, and uh, Normal Community High School. We went under Main Street and over College Avenue during that time period. We were able to save the lab schools not once, but twice. 
uh, when uh, the state tried to get rid of them in the 70s and 80s. During this time period, we, like everyone else, computerized our campus. And I remember in 1980 going through Hovey Hall, taking the IBM Selectrix off of the desk of the secretaries. They were furious because we were going on the internet and they were going to lose their typewriters. And that happened in 1980. So we started registering online instead of in line at Horton Fieldhouse, which some of you may have done. We sought to acquire Sangamon State University as our regional campus. I don't think a lot of people know about that particular part of ISU's history. We lost our first attempt to get a nursing school in 1978. And it wasn't until the 90s that we were able to add Mennonite College of Nursing to Illinois State University. In 1993, we were very, very close to getting our own Board of Trustees. And there were a lot of people at Illinois State working behind the scenes to make sure that that was going to happen. Some people characterized Illinois State University in 1967 as a meat and, t meat and potatoes university, which was not a very complimentary thing to say. And yet by 1993, we were a place to get an Ivy League education at a public school price. Some people questioned what happened to Bob Bones University. In 1967, it started to change. It grew, expanded, it focused its mission, and I think it really did become what Jesse Fell envisioned for Illinois State, and that was a dynamic learning environment here on the prairies. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. This is this you can tell this is going to be fantastic. I'm going to I'm going to jump to uh, Randy Wood at the other end. Um, uh, Randy, again, as we as we said. Uh, uh, owner and operator of the music shop, but also a uh, member of the Downtown Renewal Advisory Commission. He served for seven years as president of the Downtown Normal, no, sorry, I got picked off there because I wanted to, I wanted to, you know, W.C. Fields, I think it was one time said he spent a uh, weekend one night in Philadelphia. When Randy was describing himself, he said, uh, I mustn't forget the seven years I served as president of the Downtown Normal Business Association from 1990 to 1994. And he knows that that's only five years, but it <laughs> felt like seven years. I blew that, I'm sorry. Uh, served on the Chamber of Commerce Strategic Planning Committee about the same time, was appointed by Dr. Kern, actually, to that. He served on the Normal Theater Restoration Fundraising Committee, and one more time to kind of Quote Randy, he said he's been the music shop incorporated president and owner forever. <laughs> Let's uh, give a formal welcome to Randy Wood. Uh, well, thank you very much. I was, uh, uh, I think I was very, I was very happy to be a part of this panel. Uh, there was a lot going on in the business community uh, when I first came to Normal as a kid in the 60s and a lot of changes in the 70s, 80s. Uh, I moved the music shop out of the downtown, so we'll discuss that a little bit too. Uh, I had no desire to be in business ever. I knew that. And uh, when my dad asked me to come with the business in 1969, actually it was 73 when I just graduated from Illinois Wesleyan, uh, I said, well, I'll come for the summer. So uh, that's 42 years ago. So. <laughs> But uh, it's been very rewarding. Uh, I loved our time in uh, downtown Normal. Uh, met a lot of good friends. Uh, uh, did a lot with the Downtown Normal Business Association. We brought in events such as uh, the Sweet Corn Festival. Uh, town of Normal brought in uh, Sugar Creek Arts Festival. But it was just a, a very rewarding time to be in business. And um, even though I'm out at Landmark Mall now, still in Normal, I do miss the uptown now. But uh, uh, once again, thank you for coming this afternoon. Thank you, Randy. I wonder, we're, as I look out, we're all kind of contemporaries. We're all of the, pretty much of the same age. And I just wonder what percentage of us 
said we would never, ever work in business. <laughs> uh, Dave Anderson, next. Uh, born in the fertile part of Iowa, north central Iowa. He worked for the Iowa City Recreation Department while working on a degree in Parks and Recreation Administration. Graduated in 1961 then and held the position of Assistant Director of Recreation until the spring of 1965 when uh, they moved to Normal where he became Director of Parks and Rec for the city until the fall of 1969 when he was hired as the fifth administrator of the town of Normal, later became the first officially designated city manager and retired uh, in June of 1998. He was a volunteer for the Illinois International City County Management Association 15 years, volunteers for both hospitals, for Safe Harbor, the Mission, St. John's Lutheran Church, third community icon in a row I've introduced, Dave Anderson. Thank you. Thank you for all coming and missing the Bear game and the Cardinal game and probably a lot of other games. I was hired in June of 1965 and I'd like to introduce a member of the audience, Liz Locke. Liz, raise your hand. She was the first office associate that I had when I moved to Normal. And she was kind enough to come to today to listen to this panel. So Liz, it's nice to see you. She also told me that first time I met her that she was about ready to leave for the summer. And I said, say what? <laughs> summer is the busiest time for a Parks and Rec department. <laughs> what in the world am I gonna do? She said, oh, you'll find somebody, and I did. <laughs> but then she came back that next fall. So um, one of the first things that happened when I came here was that the town was in the process of acquiring Maxwell Park. It's 121 acres for $135,000. Now bear in mind that this was in, this was fast forward a little bit to about 1968. Um, that was a lot of money. It was over $11,000 an acre and I thought that was absolutely horrible. But in today's sense, it was pretty cheap. Uh, Dan already mentioned that in September of uh, 69, I was hired as a uh, city administrator and right after that, the council gave me the task of putting together uh, uh, a fundraising project. It was a $1.8 million bond issue for street improvements. That's a lot of money, $1.8 million. And it was passed in 1965. Uh, no, that's not wrong date. That was passed in 1969. That was made possible by, uh, in part, the adoption of a utility tax ordinance which was passed in 1965. Uh, that placed the tax on most all utilities in normal and it generated quite a bit of money. That bond issue um, was passed by 1,416 yes votes and only 311 no. Then the next, I think, probably in my opinion, very significant thing was the League of Women Voters worked very hard on the establishment of the council manager form of government in Normal. And on March 3rd, 1970, that referendum was carried by a vote of 2,291 to 763 no. So pretty good plurality. I was then appointed on March 9th of 1970 as the first city manager. And of course, Mark Peterson now serves as the second city manager. And between the two of us, we've covered 40 years. Mm. Uh, that is unheard of in city management. Uh, I had an opportunity to meet with the Peoria City Council. I was invited over there by their corporation council to talk to them about how do you retain a city manager uh, for any length of time, because in 20 years they had about 15 city managers. And one of the things I told them was the first thing you should do is get rid of your offices in City Hall. You're spending way too much time there. That shouldn't happen under council manager. And I told them a lot of other things too. Anyway, um, we uh, started to work on some new facilities and we, uh, the council was able to put together funding for a new city hall, 
uh, now the City Hall Annex, Fire Station, Public Works Facilities, and, and so on. Um, in 1986, started the development of Const Constitution Trail. Garrett Scott and Hugh Atwood were certainly instrumental with that project. Another very black chapter of my tenure as city manager was a fire strike in 1977. Uh, 24 men were put in jail for 42 days. It wasn't something that the city wanted done, but it was the fireman's attorney that told Judge Kaisley, they violated your order, Judge, they ought to go to jail. And the judge put them in jail, and that was not a good thing to do. Anyway, the fire strike finally ended after 56 days. Um, there are a lot of other things that happened during the course of my tenure with the, with the town. 32 years, yeah, 32 years altogether at Parks and Rec and, and the administrator and city manager. Um, the last thing that they asked me to participate in was on December 30th, 1999, they had a party. And it was a fact the town was totally debt free, 1988. I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Last but not least among our panelists is Paul Harmon, mayor of the town of Normal from 1985 to 1993. A member of the board of directors of the Bloomington Normal Airport Authority, the Central Illinois Regional Airport. Uh, from March of 97 until April of last year, and chairman of that group from May of 2005 until April of last year. Town of Normal Citizen of the Year, a co-recipient with his wife, Sandra, in 1993, the Illinois Shakespeare Festival Award for Outstanding Service to the Arts in 1993, Paul Harmon Jr. Day in Illinois, declared by Governor Edgar, May the 4th, 1993. The Town of Normal renamed the Arts Grants Program, the Harmon Arts Grants Program, in May of 1993, and that program was instituted when Paul was mayor. And I saved Paul to, for last, intentionally for no other reason than to run down for you 13 things that happened during the tenure of Paul Harmon as mayor of the town of Normal, and it kind of will, I think, set the stage and, and move us forward. While Paul Harmon was mayor, Mitsubishi located in Normal, Ironwood Golf Course and Residential Subdivision was developed. The town boundaries grew by 50%. The philosophy of pay as you go was implemented. The Constitution Trail was developed. The first town historic buildings survey was done. A historic preservation ordinance was adopted. First long range visioning report was finalized in 1990. It was called, I don't know if you remember, the 2015 report. Here we are. Um, the Amtrak station, not this one, but was relocated from Bloomington to downtown Normal. City Hall and public library additions were paid for with cash. The Town Arts Grants Program, now the Harmon Arts Grants Program, was initiated. The Normal Theater was acquired. And the Sister Cities Program with Vladimir and Canterbury was established. Whew. <laughs> Paul Harmon. Well, I guess I won't cover that portion. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I, I could say that one reason for the Historic Preservation Ordinance and attempting to establish some historic properties in Normal was the fact that ISU was burying most of the historic properties in, in Normal <laughs> underneath the campus. <laughs> we tried to save some. The, uh, I got... Well, I guess my, we moved to Normal in 1968 and have lived in Normal since 1968. Uh, came uh, after I graduated from law school at the University of Illinois and went to work for the Illinois Agricultural Association and Country Financial and stayed there for my entire career. 
the uh, first thing that, as I recall, really getting interested in in terms of town politics was the city manager referendum in 1970. And then in 1972, Sander was a member of the League of Women Voters and Carol Wrightan was running for mayor and we got involved in Carol's uh, campaign and I got appointed to the planning commission in 1972 by Carol and then served in for four years on the planning commission and then nine years on the city council followed by eight years as, as mayor. So I had 21 years in in an office in Normal and then I was Normal's appointee on the airport board and in between there I was Normal's appointee on the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, and Economic Development for the Bloomington Normal area which was at that time the umbrella for the chamber, the EDC and the Convention and Visitors Bureau and I was Normal's appointee and served as chairman of that for a couple of years. So I have, have been involved with Normal in one way or the other throughout this entire period and even after this entire period. I, I will just mention a couple of things. When I got on the city council in 1976, uh, the city manager form of government was still controversial. People uh, thought, it, you know, you, we, we had hired a dictator and, and that uh, the, the council was, was maybe not totally in control, but the, you learned very quickly what a wonderful administrator David Anderson was and how fortunate it was to be here when Dave was here because he is a great administrator. You, but when I got on in 1976, we had World War II vehicles in the Public Works Department. Normal really had no money. Uh, it had a utility tax and a property tax and, and half of the town was tax exempt with the university, the public schools, the churches. Uh, and it, it was very difficult to finance bigger projects in the town. So in 76, all the winning candidates campaigned on the uh, I issue of economic expansion and development. And really that's what we concentrated on for uh, almost the next 15 years. Well, at the end, uh, when I stepped down as mayor, we were not only paying cash for additions to buildings, we had a very well-funded vehicle reserve fund, and we were paying cash for major vehicle purchases for the town, et cetera. So it's almost impossible to say how much normal turned around in really a very short time in terms of its financial abilities. Uh, and that was because of not just Mitsubishi on the west side, but College Hills on the east side and other developments that occurred with, within the town. Uh, but it was a total focus by the town on e economic expansion, which would be beneficial to the residents of the community. We weren't looking for anything that was not, that the council didn't feel was beneficial to the, to the community. So I guess, that would be, uh, we went through a lot of things which uh, Dan may ask us about, so I'm not going to go into some of the other issues that came up. David mentioned uh, one of the most difficult. Uh, I was on the council during that fireman strike, and that was a very difficult time. My wife always reminds me that I had one major goal as mayor, and that was we had a couple of beer riots while Mayor Godfrey preceded me, and my goal was not to have one for eight years, and we succeeded. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you to all four of you for a uh, fascinating background. I'm going to start with a question, um, and this question for a couple of reasons. First of all, and you, you really, you, 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 you've said, you know, not everything was rosy, not everything was good news during this period of time. And, you know, our friends in the media always like to hear the bad, you know, the bad news, first of all. And secondly, you know, we all know all of politics is personal. Government is personal. Business, if it's done well, is personal. Higher education is personal. So I want to ask you really from a, a personal standpoint, I'm, I'm going to start with, uh, with Dave Anderson. What, what was your, most, your biggest challenge during this period of time or your most difficult assignment? The most difficult, without a doubt, was when Mayor Raitan approached me about serving as Metro manager, managing both Bloomington and Normal at the same time. 
she and SS Joe Snyder, who was council member in Bloomington, thought that that would be a good idea since Bloomington was going to be losing or had lost their city manager. Um, and have you, if you knew Carol Ritan, have you ever tried to tell her no? <laughs> that was a word that she could use, but you couldn't use it to her. So for 15 months, I attempted to manage both cities, and we, we made some progress with some departments, uh, like Parks and Recreation Department, Legal Department, and, and so on. We had some good cooperative things going on, but then there was a change. Carol was no longer mayor. Dick Godfrey was mayor. Dick was not entirely enamored with the Metro experiment, as it was called, in part. Uh, and Bloomington Council felt I was spending way too much time in normal, and you can imagine what the normal folks thought, I was spending way too much time in Bloomington. So after 15 months, I said, that's it, I can't do it anymore, I'd be happy to work for somebody else, but that experiment died. Although I say some of the things that we did during that period of time have continued on. There was a better understanding and relationship between both department heads of both municipalities, but it was a, a tough, tough time. The second most difficult was after the referendum uh, advisory was approved to offer alcohol for sale, Carol said, David, uh, I said, yes, ma'am, what, what, what would you like now? <laughs> she said, well, you need to write the ordinance. I said. I can't write an ordinance uh, on something of that scope. She said, sure you can. And I, I went through a, probably a half a dozen of different variations of the ordinance, but the council finally approved one. <laughs> we, we saved a lot of money in legal fees that way, but I had papers spread all over my, my living room, putting this piece with this and this one with this and so on, and the word processors weren't very popular back then, but anyway, we got it done. Thank you. Susan, in specific or in general, your, your biggest challenge or your biggest difficulty? Um, <clears throat> well, as you alluded to, the fact that uh, the relationships with the university and the town ebb and flow <laughs> over this time period. And there are times when uh, the leadership of the institution, the university is very eager to engage with the town and uh, its leadership. There are other leaders at the university who uh, really are focused either internally within the institution or have a very national scope and could care less about what the town of Normal is doing. So I think from my personal position, uh, the difficult part was at the time when the university's leadership was not necessarily interested in working with the town of Normal. And yet there were things we needed to work together on. And so uh, trying to fill that role as best you can without having the leadership of the institution behind you is, is a difficult personal challenge. Uh, David and, and the mayor have both alluded to the fact that um, sometimes the students are less amenable to change than um, at others and uh, when you think about alcohol on campus and uh, alcohol in the community the huge change that the town of normal made from going from dry to wet uh, of course that affected the institution the change in drinking age from 18 to 21 overnight changed the whole environment for drinking on campus or off campus. Um, that all culminated in probably one of the blackest eyes that Illinois State University ever received when that was the beer riots in 1983. And um, we don't make Time Magazine very often, but that was a time when we did. And I remember Neil Gansky telling me that uh, his mother, who lived in Appleton, Wisconsin, called him and said, I just got my Time magazine. You're in it. <laughs> Can't you, don't you work there? Can't you do something about those students? So uh, it, it was not 
it was not our best hour. Um, but I think as a result of that, I mean, you have to remember what was happening. There were undercover agents in the residence halls. Uh, the students did not appreciate that. Uh, they felt that the town of Normal uh, had changed the rules while they were out of town during the summer. And so uh, 83, they, they were really exercising uh, what they perceived as their rights um, during the beer riot. Unfortunately, they didn't choose to do it in a most wholesome way. But uh, in the end, uh, I think that the town um, looked, re-looked at zoning ordinances. I think both the, the community and the university looked at its policing operations and made changes. Um, the neighborhood associations, I think, were strengthened because they had legitimate concerns to bring to the forefront. And so the, those were not some of our best hours, but I think in the end there were positives that came from them. That's great. Thank you. Mayor, you want to weigh in on alcohol or another thing that you might think would have been your biggest challenge? or? Uh, I really won't go into my biggest challenge because they were certain individuals <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the uh, the beer riot to which uh, Susan is alluding happened when uh, Dick Godfrey was was the mayor uh, and it also made Johnny Carson not just Time magazine yeah. uh, the town did change ordinances in the summer it did ch put in additional regulations in the summer and as I recall uh, and you can fact check this. As I recall, I voted no because the students weren't in town and I didn't think it was a good idea to do this over the summer when the students were out of town. While the ordinances that were put into place were had some very uh, legitimate uh, issues that they were covering, it, you, you just knew the students would react that they were not in town when these ordinances were, were being considered and that they didn't have a chance to uh, address them. And so it, that, that, was a, that was a problem, and it, it helped trigger, uh, I don't think it was solely that, there, was, there, was, there were other issues going on, but it helped trigger uh, the, uh, what was a major disturbance. Uh, when, when I became mayor, uh, we had already had a university liaison committee, which was three members of the council and three members of the university administration. Uh, it was actually at the suggestion of Councilman Jeff Fritzen at the time, but we established a student liaison committee uh, with three members of the student government and three members of the town council. And I do think uh, having that, having uh, trying to work with what was called party patrol, which was where students would be the first people to arrive at a party out in the neighborhood uh, and to see if they could calm things down before the police would would arrive. Uh, if there was a second call, the police would go out. But we, we tried to use students to help out into the neighborhoods uh, to calm some of these situations down. Remember that ISU grew very rapidly and was moving out into the neighborhoods. So there wasn't really, there was really not an opportunity for the people who had resided in the neighborhoods to get used to the fact that all at once they have a student apartment building next to their house and they're having these weekend parties. And so you were, you were having these clashes because of the expansion of the university in a very rapid fashion out, out into the neighborhoods. It took three down zonings of property trying to pull the borders of where student housing would be built uh, back in closer to the campus in order to help alleviate this problem. Uh, one of those presidents who wasn't necessarily uh, geared to worrying too much about the town was, was Tom Wallace, but I congratulated him when he built the parking deck next to the uh, Bone Student Center. Because if there was anything that was also moving out in the neighborhood, you were pushing parking lots out in the neighborhood, you were taking homes down, uh, the parking decks kept the university from having to move out just to park cars. Uh, so there were a lot of things that were working together to, to try to, to bring this uh, situation together uh, and to resolve it. I think when the 
university finally settled in at 20,000 students. The, the borders of where the students would primarily live got pretty well set. Uh, and the times changed. You, you weren't having the end of the Vietnam influence on, on students. Students are <coughs> different today. Uh, they, they really, there is not this demonstrative aspect uh, that uh, w was existing at that point in time. So all of this together uh, served to calm the situation. And, uh, you know, I always felt we had good relationships with the, with the university administrators, and we worked as hard as we could to have good relations with the student body. Uh, and I think times have changed, and, and things are really pretty calm today. Just to kind of complete the, the, the spectrum, Randy, from the business owner's perspective, uh, alcohol and or other uh, challenges? Well, anytime there was a student march on City Hall, uh, my dad and I stood in the front window of the music shop hoping they, nobody's going to throw a brick through the window if we're there. Uh, in the, in my, my first experience with any kind of adversity um, in the business and the downtown was, as Dave mentioned, uh, firefighter strike, and we had uh, we had firefighters walking in the front door saying, "Do you support this strike or do you not?" Mm. And trying to stay neutral was the most difficult thing. So we get phone calls say, "I, I hear you aren't supporting this strike," and we're trying to stay neutral on it. So. Uh, we were put between a rock and a hard place, and I'm sure a lot of the businesses were at that time. Um, as far as the, the, the marches on City Hall, we were pretty lucky in that they stayed pretty calm, at least walking by the music shop and down Beaufort Street. Um, but there were a, a lot of events happened then. I remember standing in the parking lot watching Alexander Lumber burn in 1980. and. Uh, we first thought it was the music shop that was burning. Um, but uh, the challenges uh, just kind of kept coming. But I'll say one thing, the Town of Normal staff um, was always great about working with the business owners in the downtown. And uh, I'll get a little bit more into that when I took over as uh, president of the Business Association in the early 90s. But. Uh, uh, the challenges uh, were also just to uh, really try to get new people to come to the downtown, new faces, and we were always dealing with this image that uh, downtown was nothing but a campus town, that it was just full of student shopping there and, and that was it. And I was discussing this uh, a few days ago with Mayor Coos. And, uh, so we're always uh, up against that perception, and um, that's why we kept coming up with events. And, uh, but uh, yes, I remember the firefighter strike. I remember uh, the marches on City Hall. I remember them vividly. Could I add two points? Number yes. one, when Alexander Lumber Yard burned down, it was a troubled young kid. It was not the students who <laughs> burned down Alexander Lumberyard. Uh, just want to clarify that. And uh, th th that's the only point I want to okay. clarify. Yeah. Well, the other thing I would add is we also amended the uh, ordinance in the town of Normal on discrimination and added matriculation so that businesses were not allowed to discriminate against students. And there had been issues with students getting credit or it, et cetera. And uh, th so they did come to the town. And that was another thing that we did to try to help with the situation was to add matriculation to the, to the ordinance. I think it's impossible that our audience could not be engaged in, in what you're talking about. It's really terrific. But just to kind of open things up, Mercy, why not, is there anybody that uh, at this point has a, a, a question for the panel? Yes, sir. Hang on just a second while sh uh, Mercy brings the microphone over. I, I was gone, excuse me. I was gone at a period of time, not knowing about the beer strike, but I've got to say it just kind of plays something on me. 
Good for normal. Little guts, a little beer strike. What would it have been like if you had, had gold discovered? You know what I mean? I think it just adds more to the history. I just, I think it's just uh, something to look at. But the charm of it is, uh, where are we going? Where are we expanding and where is normal be going? I think that's a question to ask of the panel. What do they vision if it was in a time capsule in 50 years or something like that? Okay, so maybe jumping from the, the, the period of time that we're talking about, what, what occurred that, that continues to develop that, that, that is possibly going to take us further into the, into the future? Paul? Hmm. Having gone through uh, quite a bit of Normal's history in the last few weeks, uh, and Jesse Fell envisioned Normal as a family community and he envisioned Normal as an education community and sort of that shining light on the hill kind of a community. Uh, I think you go back and you look at what people have tried to do. They have tried to keep Normal a family community, a good place to live. And so while you may argue we don't need that development or some other development. I think the city councils have tried very hard to keep Normal a nice place to live. They also value very highly that it's an education community and uh, Normal is just connected with education. It's got Illinois State, it's got the Community College, it's got Lincoln College and Wesleyan on its border. Uh, and this has always been a key component of normal. Uh, so these two features are the two basic features. And if you look, uh, the business development has been to help be able to fund the community services that are required to have, have a full service community. Uh, the services offered by normal are excellent. I would expect them to be that 25 years from now. But I will be very surprised if normal is still not focused on being a good place to live and a good place for education. Susan, I'd like to particularly uh, address this to you, obviously. Um, obviously, ISU is a very visible part of the, of the community. In fact, I mean, the town of normal really takes its name from Illinois State Normal mm -hmm. School. Uh, and, you know, we, we've talked about how the, the town impacts the university. Is there anything else you'd like to say about the way ISU ha has had perhaps major effects on the town during the, the period of time that we're talking about? Well, of course, uh, this time period is the, the big growth period for both the university and the town between 1967 and 1993. And I think it's, uh, when I was working on reading a lot of background material for today's presentation, the thing that struck me was that the town of Normal and the university have been able to grow at about the same rate. Mm. And I think that that equalization has been very important to the success of not only Illinois State University, but to the town of Normal. There are other university communities throughout Illinois where you don't have that balance. You either have the big university dictating to the community what's going to happen, or you have the reverse. You have a, the university in that community plays a very limited role in the overall focus of the community. But here in Normal, David Strand and I chatted about this quite a bit. Um, the idea that Normal and Illinois State grew at about the same rate. If you look at the enrollment in the 1960s and the enrollment percentage in today's university, we still, even though we've grown, we're still about the same proportion of the total population of Normal as we were in the 60s. So that balance, I think, has been key to the success of the institution and to Normal. The thing I admire about the town of Normal 
is every August they literally merge with a city the size of Libertyville or Charleston mm. or East Moline. And when you think about that, that the town of Normal is prepared from an infrastructure and an organizational standpoint to absorb over 20,000 new citizens, and the university students and faculty consider themselves citizens of Normal while they're here, um, I, I think that's absolutely amazing that that can happen. And uh, I, I see no reason why that's not going to continue. Uh, Randy, uh, of, the, of the panelists, you're a little bit unique because you're not a part of the uh, administration of the town, not a part of the you know, administration of the university. Uh, according to my notes, uh, about 1960 is when your family actually almost lived in the, the downtown neighborhood and then operated the business in the in the downtown give us as a as a, as a non-administrator a non-university person and as a business person kind of a a sense of, of of living in this area during that time period in addition to, to working in, in in the area well um my folks located us on uh the 900 block of broadway so we we're only about four uh, blocks from the downtown and uh I was just 10 years old, and uh, my only independence was my bicycle, so uh, I uh, went to the downtown normal just constantly. I rode my bike down there after school all the time, and uh, uh, my folks did almost all their business in the downtown. And this is what really struck me when I was looking back at the different businesses uh, in the 1960s in the downtown. Uh, my uh, downtown basically became uh, the center of our lives. It uh, met 90% of our needs on a daily basis. And uh, my family patronized most of the businesses in the downtown. I mean, my folks did their banking there uh, with Citizen Savings and Loan and Bank of Illinois. Uh, my mother brought, bought groceries from Eisner's, Wurglers <coughs> Meat Market. Uh, we still had Banner Baking Company right across the street from us on Beaufort Street. Our family physician uh, was located in Fruin Clinic, which is on the corner of uh, Fell Avenue and North Street. Uh, our dentist was right next to the Normal Theater. We got our haircuts at Shorty's and Hudson's. I still get my haircut at King's Fold, Bill Hudson. Um, we had our we shop at Camera Craft. Uh, had our shoes repaired at Warwick's, our suits dry cleaned at uh, Model Paris. We ate at Klein's Coffee Shop, K. Lynn's, Chuck's Deli, The Gallery, Rockies, and Josie's. And these are businesses that came into being over the 60s and 70s. And Klein's became King's, King's uh, became Welcome In. Uh, solid Gold uh, appeared, um, I think it was about 79, they were in Little Broadway Mall. Uh, had Eaton's Jewelers. We dealt with Lindy's Hardware, which became Raiders. And as a kid, I just rode my bike everywhere. I grew up at uh, the Normal Theater. Uh, so being on that uh, fundraising committee was a lot of fun for me. Uh, I knocked on a lot of doors. And uh, bought my first record album at Libby Lane's. Um, I, I, as a kid, I went into Randall's Variety Store all the time. And uh, of course, the Velvet Freeze. And, uh, <laughs> I got a kick out of that because uh, it had a sign that said, uh, teen time 15 minutes. So um, my sisters and I still laugh about this because we, we took it literally. We thought, well, if we have a wonder dog and uh, order fries and a uh, uh, hot fudge sundae, uh, we had to snarf that down 15 <laughs> minutes. So that's, you know. So I always got a kick out of that. But uh, we dealt in the downtown. Uh, you could get uh, paint at Don Smith's painting place. Uh, my sisters and I took piano lessons from the Scherer sisters uh, who had an apartment uh, just about above uh, Garlic Press on North Street. And uh, then my dad set up a charge account over at uh, Harold Fowler's uh, Philip 66. We bought uh, furniture and flooring at Stanley and Paul's regardless of whether it was personal or for the music shop. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, I bought a stereo from Apple Tree Stereo. My dad bought one a little later on from uh, Glenn Poor's Audio Video. So 
we did all our shopping in the downtown. We didn't even think about going outside of the downtown. But uh, it was pretty funny, though. My, my dad had set up a charge account at uh, Fowler 66, Harold 66, and that way uh, us kids, while we're in school and in college, could just stop there and charge gas. So, uh, so my dad didn't tell me after college that he wasn't paying for my gas anymore. So I stopped there and, you know, I just sat there and it's full service. Uh, either Chuck or Harold were always, you know, doing your windshield and checking your, wild, your wiper blades and uh, just very nice people. And so I just sat there and uh, Harold came around to the uh, uh, driver's window and he said, Randy, he said, your dad says the party's over. <laughs> So I figured though I probably had the last laugh because I'd stop in like three times a week and have a dollar's worth of gas put in because that's all I had. So, uh, <laughs> But uh, uh, I just want to reiterate that back in the 60s, uh, the downtown was a full service downtown and we did our business there. So the fact that my dad ended up with a business in the downtown wasn't a big surprise. So, Thank you for that trip down memory lane. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it, was, it was fascinating. I spent uh, several afternoons at Normal Library just going through the Polk City Directory. Oh, you're bursting my bubble. Oh, I man. thought you had all of that on the top of your head. Yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> it was great. It was really, uh, really eye-opening, and uh, you're right, it was memory lane. So. Great. Uh, Mayor, you, you've talked about the 1976 mayoral and council election as being a watershed moment for the town. Could you expand on that a little bit? Why do you think that? Well, I mentioned a little bit in the introduction. Uh, in 1976, uh, the real issue was what should the focus be for uh, the, the city council? Uh, and all of the winning candidates, uh, Mayor Godfrey, uh, Paul Mattingly, Parker Lawless, and myself, campaigned on economic expansion for the town. That we had to do something to increase the tax base of the community. When you had a community that was at least 50% tax exempt from the property tax, and your major source of income was the outside of property tax was the utility tax, which had been passed by the uh, council in like the mid 60s. Uh, the sales tax was a very small part of the income to the community. So we uh, decided uh, it, as a group when we were campaigning, it, and it wasn't really planned, it was just all of us had focused on the same basic issue as being important to normal. I think having that group elected and with the people who were on the council, uh, I think sharing that view, the, the holdover members of the council sharing that view, one of whom's in the back there, Mr. Hammett, uh, the, our, we really became pretty focused on, on in, increasing economic expansion so that we could pay for the services that this expanding community needed. Uh, the fire department had only gone full time a, a few, few years before that. It had, been, uh, it had been a combination of a few full time firemen and a volunteer fire department. Uh, and as this community was expanding, you couldn't continue to rely on a volunteer fire department. The police department was expanding uh, and public works was really expanding uh, because of the community growing. Uh, so with this focus, uh, and with a little luck, I mean, I can't say that because the city council decided to focus on this, we got College Hills Mall. We got College Hills Mall because there was a developer who was thinking of developing it, and the council's part was uh, how much of an incentive package could we put together. And I would have to explain to people who are always, a lot of people are always against incentive packages, that that they're just a necessity in the modern world. Uh, you're not going to get major development without doing something to, to assist in that development. Uh, and a sales tax rebate was what we did uh, to help pay for infrastructure improvements, et cetera, to, uh, on, the, on the privately owned part of that 
development. Uh, I can still remember, I can't remember the year, but I can remember the year that we met our, I can remember when we had met our commitment and the sales tax rebate ended and all of the sales tax was coming to the town of Normal. Hmm. Uh, it, it helped the budget the next year. Hmm. The um, Mitsubishi, again, uh, we, we had to work on a package along with Bloomington and McLean County for Mitsubishi to be here, but the uh, Governor Thompson was the person who had been working on Mitsubishi for quite a number of years to get them to Illinois. Uh, the issue there became, was it going to go to normal or was it going to go to Indiana? Now, while there were some other communities in Illinois that were trying to get the Mitsubishi plant, it became pretty clear pretty early on that if it was going to be in Illinois, it was going to be on the west side of normal. It wasn't going to be anywhere else in Illinois. They were not going to go to Peoria for whatever reason. Uh, they had focused on this community. So, but we had to then put together a package, uh, uh, help acquire the land, et cetera, so that Mitsubishi could come here. So we had a very major role, but the council had to decide that this would be an improvement for the community uh, in order to go ahead. We are a very, we have become a very service oriented, uh, education oriented, medical oriented community. We don't have very many jobs in what would be blue collar or gray collar. And you need jobs in all sectors to have a balanced community. So I think our focus was Mitsubishi is really replacing the jobs that we're losing at GE and the jobs that were in jeopardy at Eureka Williams, which eventually moved out. Uh, and this was to hold employment in this sector of the community. But I want to reemphasize, uh, and then we were getting other development also. We got, we, uh, got the Ironwood subdivision up on the north end, uh, which David did a cost analysis on along with the staff that we would not do Ironwood if it did not show that the development of Ironwood would pay for the cost of extending the services to Ironwood. So we got very much interested in making sure uh, analyzing subdivisions to make sure that there was a payback on subdivisions, not just expand the town to expand the town, uh, a philosophy that continues to this day. Uh, so there's just an awful lot going on, and uh, the consuls through this entire period sort of played off of that 76 election, as far as I am concerned anyway, to say that we need the economic expansion, but we need to do it in a way that is community friendly. And that is what the councils have tried to do. Through all of the comments here, we've hit, I, I've got an easy job because, you know, I, I'm basically sitting back asking about stuff that I'm interested in. But a, as I did my, you know, five minutes of preparation for this, and I was thinking about the ma major things that, that had occurred during the period of time in my memory, we've hit just about all of them with one exception. And that is my recollection of a big furore over water. David, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go to you. Uh, talk about the water, water shortage issue, the, the events that kind of led up to or, 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 or involved that, that issue. Okay. Um, the first International City Management Conference I went to in 1970, um, I received a call from our water superintendent saying, we've got a huge problem. We have to declare a water emergency. We just don't have enough water to make, meet the current demands of the citizens. That was even after we had put on some uh, suggested conservation methods and so forth. Uh, it was really shortly thereafter that the City Council, uh, it was um, in 1971 that the Council approved funds to build or develop, drill two wells on the Roe gravel pit site. And that gave us additional water 
um, I think it was close to three quarters of a million gallons of water per day from those two additional wells. Um, it was very embarrassing when the city of Bloomington required that I personally deliver a purchase order that would authorize the purchase of water from the city of Bloomington. They wouldn't turn the valve on on Division Street until I personally delivered that to Mayor Bittner. That was pretty embarrassing, but we did it anyway. Then uh, Bill Hammett, who's in the back of the room, and Kenny Schroeder started talking about the San Cajote in Muhammad Valley and Danvers aquifers, and there's a confluence of those three aquifers in the Danvers area, that there should be a great deal of water available. And in, in September of 72, uh, George Farnsworth, uh, Farnsworth and Wiley completed a report on the development of wells on the west side. And that eventually, um, we did some test drilling on township road right of way. Uh, we had a difficulty getting permission to uh, drill on some sites that we wanted to purchase. In fact, uh, Mark Peterson and I were talking the other day, and he said, I hadn't been here very long, but it was February of 88. We went out to one of the sites because I had a call from Joe Martin, our water superintendent, saying, you better get out here. We've got problems. Some of the property owners had gathered, and there were two gentlemen that had shotguns. Now, they were pointed upward, uh, so that was a good sign. <laughs> Mark said, I'm going to stay in the car. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, wait a minute, an assistant ought to be out in front. <laughs> when I got back to the car, he said, what did you tell him? I said, hell, I don't remember. <laughs> but there wasn't any incident other than that. Uh, the guys, you know, they were upset that we were going to take their water. We are going we're gonna to take their water from their land. They were going to be the next Sahara Desert and so on. We had calls from people after the wells went in that they were already dewatered their wells. We hadn't pumped a drop of water yet, but we bought some new wells eventually. We should have done it right away. It would have been a lot easier. But that, that uh, you know, the three people that I would give credit to the West Wellfields are Ken Schroeder, Bill Hammond, and then a little bit later on, Carol Ritan. But she's, she pushed the program. In fact, I have a, a minutes of the council meeting, September 11th, 1972, when Farnsworth gave the verbal and written reports on the, on the West Well field, and then Kenny Schroeder listed six we reasons why we needed to go forward. And obviously, they went forward. And that's part of the reason that Mitsubishi was able to locate in Bloomington Normal. And Normal provided the sewer, but Bloomington provided the water. Mm -hmm. This is the book that the mayor I think he took this one with him to Springfield when he made the presentation. And uh, eventually Mitsubishi came, which was certainly one of the highlights of my career was being involved with that project. I was the chief negotiator for the local governmental entities. We had a package all put together. Uh, there was an agreement that the assessment for the plant would be at $70 million. Everybody approved it except Unit 5. Unit 5 would not approve it, and after years of litigation and a lot of time and effort by all the parties, the agreement was finally reached at $20 million. Then Unit 5 negotiated a separate agreement with Mitsubishi to get additional money. Obviously, it didn't make a lot of us very happy on that project. But, you know, the jobs that are brought to the community, not only for the plant itself, but the supply industries was extremely beneficial to the town, and I sure as heck hope they can fi find a buyer and keep that facility operating. Anybody in the uh, it's over here, Mercy? You're talking about building up everything, but there was one thing that went down rapidly and that's railroads. Uh, we came in 71, and I think they used to run one train a year down that north-south <laughs> line. 
and soon it was gone. And did you worry much about that? Did it cause a problem to lose the railroads for a while? Well, I, I, from my perspective, uh, I don't think it was a huge problem. Obviously, it affected many folks that, that worked for the railroad and lived in Bloomington Normal. And there's a lot of people that, uh, that, that lived here and worked on it. I remember George Broughton was a fellow that l worked on the railroads, and uh, he was pretty upset when they started reducing the number of trains and so on. But I, I don't think it had a tremendous impact. The, the fact that we had the tracks here, though, was a reason for Mitsubishi to locate where it did because it could use the rail service that was still in existence. Uh, so the uh, loss of the freight service uh, was the same problem as you had nationally. A lot of stuff went to trucks rather than the railroads, so the freight was still moving. It was just moving in a different way. Uh, I think the fact that we have the Chicago-St. Louis uh, run uh, and the l very large number of passengers that the station downstairs has is, a, is an indication that passenger service was always healthy here. We just needed somebody to run the trains. Just, just as a, as a follow-up, and I, I'm asking this question, I, I, I have no idea. Would we even be in this room without the railroad? I mean... I don't think so. The town might not be here without the railroads. I mean, that was one prime reason to locate here was it was the, the crossing of two railroads was right here at this spot. But the fact that it's been maintained now has this, mm -hmm. this inter, intermodal center mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. with yeah, all would, of the would Jesse, would Jesse Fell have come three miles north of Bloomington and said, this is where I want the university if there hadn't been trains here to bring students from around the state to this location? I mean, that's a good question. Normal may not have existed as normal if it was not for the railroads. No, they, there are students when alumni come back. Yeah, I mean, some of our older alumni remember putting their laundry on the train when it went through to be taken off the train oh, in southern man. Illinois. <laughs> and then their mothers would send it back um at the at the on wow. the next train so uh the train train's been important to the university and certainly a lot of students ride that train yes when you look at and evaluate characteristics of healthy vital college towns um are there some things that you would wish we have that we don't have or something that you really wanted to make sure we had that you worked hard to get? I mean, what are some of those kinds of characteristics? I, I think where normal is fortunate is while ISU is a very major contributor to the community, it's not the dominating influence that the University of Illinois is in Urbana-Champaign. That it is part of the community, it is not the community. And I think this balance that Susan talked about earlier uh, is, is, has been very a very integral part of, of making it work here. Uh, as we've mentioned, there were some, some times during the rapid expansion that there, there were some problems. Uh, but I'll relate a story on that. When my predecessor, uh, Richard Godfrey, would go to mayor's conferences and they would go around, and R R Rich would come back and tell us about this. They would go around the room and say, what is the major problem in your community, in your community? And, and there would be a crime problem or there would be an employment problem and they would have all these problems. And they would get to Dick and he would say, well, we had a beer riot. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody would go, oh, <laughs> you know, that, that's your major problem? <laughs> and uh, I, I just think that there, because the founders of Normal wanted a university here, it's been part of the community, I just think everybody has worked over all of these years just to make it work here. And, and I don't know what you would do to change the blend. Uh, it has worked well the way it has developed here. One, th one thing about Illinois State University is there's a tremendous amount of talent there. And I don't remember how many times that I called 
and probably called Susan and said, who on your faculty or staff could I talk to about X, Y, Z? Always got a name. And it might be just somebody from administration, but it might be somebody in the building trades that our inspection department was having an issue with in interpreting code and so on. So there's a there was, I mean, a, a measurable amount of time and effort that was spent <coughs> free gratis uh, uh, by individuals who were happy to help the community uh, with whatever problem was we were having. It, I, thank you very much. I think that's an important aspect that university brings to the community. Um, the number of resources sitting on the Illinois State University campus are just amazing. And they're international resources. I mean, we have people on our campus who, who develop international standards and who participate in international research. And um, they're right here in the middle of normal. And the town and its citizens can benefit from, so much from that. And the volunteers, you can't name an organization in Bloomington Normal that's not got somebody from Illinois State University leading the group or participating or volunteering with the group and that goes for the students too. And I think one of the things that we often overlook and, and I love this whole idea of balance because I do think it is a key to the success of this community in that we, I was chairman of the McLean County Chamber of Commerce for, uh, for a stint and one of the things that the community was always very proud of was that balance that we had educational institutions, big time uh, employers, small employers, independent businesses, manufacturing, and that balance is what made the community very successful. The other thing I think the university contributes, and we haven't talked about this too much, but um, the town of Normal and the people who live in Normal have access to huge facilities that they did not have to float a referendum for and they did not have to pay for. When you think about Redbird Arena and the Bone Student Center and the Center for Performing Arts and all of those kinds of facilities that are located here in our community. Don't leave out the Milner Library. Well, big, Milner. big fan <laughs> of the Milner Library. Milner Library too. And I wish more of our citizens would actually take advantage of Milner. I think some people don't know it's open uh, to anyone. So uh, yes, it's a major resource. But those are major, major expensive resources that by virtue of the university providing those and funding those, make them available, uh, you know, free, if you will, from, mm -hmm. a, from, uh, from a taxpayer standpoint. And uh, we're, when we're talking about money, um, there was a recent economic development study done and the economic impact study done on the impact that the university has on the community and in two years ago as of two years ago the average uh, amount of money that Illinois State contributes to the local economy is over 600 million dollars a year so when you have that kind of resource sitting in your community um, and a willingness on both parts to share. I thought it was really interesting. I looked back at the history. The last big celebration of the 100th anniversary of the town of Normal was celebrated in the Bone Student Center with a hoot and nanny. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's hard to separate ISU and the town of Normal. <laughs> they're, they're certainly benefit each other and they're certainly closely entwined. Beer riots, hoot nannies, <laughs> shotguns. Still sounds like Mayberry sometimes, <laughs> kind of normal. Uh, uh, Steve Vogel had his hand up. Both uh, Mayor Harmon and Mr. Anderson mentioned uh, pay as you go philosophy and debt free status. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how that evolved and uh, really what it has meant to the years following this period, 1993, into the current century if anything? Well, uh, I can tell you how it started. An assistant of mine by the name of Tom DiGiulio, we were going through our budgeting process and we needed a new fire truck that was, I think at that time was like $175,000. Now it'd be about 400, 500,000. I said, you know, we, we just, we don't have that kind of money to, to, to buy that truck. We ought to be setting aside some money every year 
and Tom said, well, you know, we should do we should do that. We should call it a vehicle reserve fund. And that's how it started. The first year, it was very modest. We didn't have very much money we could put into it. But we started to life cycle all of our equipment, all of our rolling stock. Um, and eventually, we had every piece of equipment fully funded by this vehicle reserve fund. And uh, Mark Peterson tells me now that they have, on a number of occasions, borrowed money from that vehicle reserve fund. I'm not even sure that's what they call it now, but that fund, anyway, borrowed money to do some project and then eventually paid it back over a period of time. So that's really how it started, and it was, it was back in 19, uh, Tom was here, probably about 76 or so, I think, uh, that it started and uh, continues on today. Uh, when Mitsubishi uh, came to town, uh, it required some bonding on the part of the town, on part of the city of Bloomington, part of the county, to pay for the local improvements. And after we issued those bonds, uh, there was conversation on the council about we don't want to issue any more bonds. Well, if you don't issue any more bonds, you've got to figure out some way <laughs> To, to pay for things. Uh, and that's when the mantra, pay as you go, became sort of a, a public statement by the council. We want to be on a pay as you go basis. We want to pay off our bonds. And after we issued those bonds in 86 or 87, Dave, I can't remember, uh, the town of Normal didn't issue any more bonds until after the year 2000, and it actually paid off all of its indebtedness. Now, when Ironwood was built, we did need to borrow a little bit of money, uh, but we borrowed it from a bank. We did not bond for it. Uh, something tells me it was like $250,000 or something. Uh, but we paid that off in a, in a short period of time. Uh, you had to... It, that is where this growth in the in the tax base of the community came into play because it was allowing us to to fund these projects. Uh, when we built the addition to uh, the normal public library and we paid cash for it, we uh, actually increased the property tax a little bit and saved the money for two or three years in order to have the money to pay cash for the addition to the normal public library. Uh, and we paid cash for the addition to the city hall. We paid cash for an expansion of the uh, number one fire station. Uh, and we went from not having any, not having much money, I shouldn't say we didn't have any, but not having any excess money in 1976, to my last two or three years as mayor, I can remember Dave, at sort of at the end of each fiscal year, coming into my office, I don't know if you remember this, Dave, but he would come in and say, Oh, we've got $400,000 surplus this year. Uh, we better put it in the vehicle reserve fund. <laughs> and, and we were doing, so by the end, of, uh, by the early 90s, we were, we were having, uh, uh, through good budgeting and, and, and careful planning, we were having excesses uh, in our budget and allowing us to uh, really fund the vehicle reserve fund. When we could pay later on $500,000 and pay cash for a fire truck, I mean, that was amazing, because uh, I don't know what those would cost today. When I, the last one we bought at the airport for a special uh, airport vehicle, the fire truck cost a million dollars. So, I mean, these things are not cheap to buy. Uh, so, so the pay-as-you-go remains the, as, as I understand it, pay-as-you-go remains the philosophy of the town of Normal, except for uptown. The rest of the community is on pay-as-you-go. And uh, I think if you read the article in the paper today about how they were going to use that sales tax increase next year was to pay for a lot of public improvements in the course of the next year. So uh, they're still trying to do pay as you go in normal. So it's not, it's not gone except for uptown where, where there has been substantial bonding uh, and we won't get into right or wrong on that. That's just, but that's, so the philosophy is still there. Thank you. In, in the interest of balance, I, I want to ask Randy one more question uh, so that we can have just a, a little last focus on business. And I, uh, uh, I believe your family moved the 
the music shop to the, what was then called the downtown area in 1969. You, you left and moved out to the east side in 1999. Will you talk about those two things very briefly? Yes, it was uh, probably an easier decision for my dad. Uh, we were at uh, 108 East Mulberry Street, which was right next to then the Scottish Rite Temple, now the Bloomington Performing Arts Center. And uh, that block was being reconfigured. Uh, we used to have a little, I think, Callan's Sporting Good across the street from us, and that block just went away. Uh, really, the only reason he was located in uh, that area was because uh, he bought out a little Noonan Music Company, and that's where the location was. And so uh, I had asked my dad earlier about it, well, why did you come to downtown Normal? And he said, really, to be closer to Illinois State University. Now, I'm sure a lot of things played into this. Uh, we we're already located near the downtown, and we we're already doing shopping in the downtown. So uh, he went ahead and uh, moved the business in 69. That's when he asked me to come with the business then, and uh, turned out to be the endless summer. So. Uh, in 1999, uh, I moved the business out of the downtown to Landmark Mall. Uh, several years earlier, uh, I had moved our Pro Sound Center out there. Uh, in the 80s, we took over, um, it was Merle Norman's Cosmetics on 134 East Buford, and um, Pro Sound went in there, then we eventually took over 136 East Buford next door, but that was still just two rooms, it was still small. And uh, before I made the decision to move, I talked to uh, uh, all the landlords who had any available property in the downtown. And I, I even toyed with the idea of uh, breaking up the music shop into different uh, businesses. And it really came down uh, to needing at least double to three times the space we had and getting back under the same roof as our Pro Sound Center. So uh, I, I felt guilty. I sometimes felt like a traitor leaving the downtown because I was so closely affiliated with it. But at that time, it was certainly the right thing to do for the music shop. So uh, uh, being as involved with the Downtown Normal Business Association, it was a, it was a tough decision. It really was. but. Uh, uh, a lot of business was starting to go east, and Landmark Mall was built in the 70s, and uh, uh, I always thought we would be in a standalone uh, building, but uh, it didn't work out that way, but it's worked out okay. And as I said earlier, I, I do miss being uh, in the downtown or uptown. So. Okay. Uh, we are on our, the dot of our finish time, so thank you so much for sharing your Sunday afternoon with us. And let's give our speakers one last <laughs> round of applause. OK? Enjoy. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Made it through today. <laughs> How you been? Good? Yeah, I've been okay. I've been busier than Dickens this last year. Really? Jeez. Steve. So it'd be interesting to read three things. They had 25 here. They could say 35 or 40. Got an open mic here. Well done. You know what? You it's ought to do it. Prepare that, don't you? I mean, you've got a manuscript. Yes. Businesses. April Anderson. You said um, the University of Arkansas. Don't you think, Blaze? Oh. Okay. So, and you can oh. tell her. And you said you bought stereo from Street, so you had to have it. I bought mine from Apple Tree uh, Stereo. They came into Bean in 1973. They opened in 73. I think Glenn Pores came in later uh, in that decade or maybe even around 80, but uh, my dad had, uh, they were right just down on the same block as the music shop. Yeah. And then, he, he just, and then, he just, Dave, you said Mitsubishi, <laughs> 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 or in the question was, would it be in, in the normal or in the Indiana? And you said the
and it just wasn't. We put together a package, yeah. We had to come either a service oriented community or a. I thought it was. Yeah. Well, I thought that was I thought that was Bill, how you been? My last council meeting, they let me vote. My last, very last council meeting. There's a motion to adjourn. And I voted no. That's probably it. Let me show you this. So this is uh, just the longer you went. I was the so I, I had so much uh, information. No problem. We didn't get to like I'm the Parkway and College Hills, which I did a ton of research on too. But uh, if you look at this, look at the change in the 70s. Kaylin's became the restaurant. That was also uh, Chuck sure. Peterson. Which became Chuck's Deli. Normal printing became Tennis Anyone. Gallery opened. Stanley and Paul's added a wholesale division. Uh, Sign of the Times, which was Chuck Peterson's first place gift shop, became discount. Oh, I think administratively uh, there's a lot of shop and Hudson's Barber Shop actually became advanced uh, TV sales for a while. I have then, if you remember, Bill uh, took over that Culligan space. Uh, Two city managers, so I think, yeah. you have to have. So, uh, um, the two you know, Hudson's would be became uh, Mitsubishi Bill Hudson's place became Indiana. King's Bowl. We had Thompson's Flowers came from Tom's Flowers. Them, he said we became Broadway Mall, the government was tied out in the shop, Campbell's Camera Center, and Ram Crafts. But there's just so many things that just go on and on and on. It's crazy. Now, they do some things together. Yeah, I've been retired seven years, so I don't. Really uh, know well, well, how much has changed. How you know, this? What I think is really better than they did in the past. Uh, uh, libraries. Uh, there was just nothing. Both of us are included in the service industry. It was really the financial and some more. You had the water departments. And I looked at the normal stuff.